morning. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere I go. Let take a look at the five and ten. Does anybody know what a five and ten is anymore? For those of you who are younger, a five and ten is the dollar store. That's the new manifestation of the five and ten. When does, when does Christmas season actually begin? Does it begin in September? Maybe August 15th. Some people think it begins the day after Thanksgiving. Christmas season actually begins, anybody know? December 25th. December 25th. So we get into the kind of this struggle. Pastor Sherry tries to pick out the music in the right way in which we, we honor your desire to sing Christmas songs even though we're not really supposed to sing them until after the 25th of December when you're so tired of Christmas songs you don't want to sing them anymore. It's, it's confusing. Now for some of us, the music and the lights and the festivity and seeing the eggnog back on the shelf in the store. Oh, no, 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 no. Helps us to think of Jesus. For others, they feel like somehow it, it isn't right to Jesus. It's sort of almost an, an insult that we get into the commercialization so early. This is actually the season of Advent. Over the next few months, we're going to actually talk about the life of Jesus. Who he was, what he did. And what that means for us. We're going to learn about Jesus. Which to me makes a lot of sense considering we call ourselves Christians. We should learn who this person is, right? But before we go too quickly to Jesus, we want to start with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. They, were, they actually grew up somewhat together. They were only a few months apart. And we have this passage from the book of Mark that says that John is coming, a voice in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. He's the one who's getting us ready for Jesus. So before we get to Christmas, we have Advent, and before we get to Jesus, we're going to talk a little bit about his cousin, John. John called us to a wilderness place, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Wilderness is a, a place where we don't have the distractions. We don't have all the confusion. We don't have all the noise. We can just focus on God. And John calls us to prepare our lives. In Romans chapter 12, it tells us, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good pleasing, and perfect will. So God calls us to be transformed, to be changed, to prepare our lives for Jesus to come. What would you think would be some ways we could do that? We could read the Bible. That's a good one. Pray. That's something we could do. We could do what we're doing right now. We could worship God, right? Actually, the Bible even calls us to something called fasting. You know what that is? That's when you don't eat food intentionally as a spiritual discipline to God. Now, you could give something else up, by the way, like eggnog or something. All right? But, but this isn't a diet. This is a way of proving to ourselves that God is more important than anything. These are great ways we can prepare for the coming of God. And I suspect John did a lot of that. He lived in the wilderness. He, he probably 
didn't have his parents around anymore. They were quite old when he was born. He would be about 30 years old, same age as Jesus. The difference is Jesus was the son of a carpenter. John was the son of a priest, a high priest, Zechariah. So he had a little more of a sense about him of being holy from birth. He dressed a little weird. He wore camel hair with a big belt wrapped around his waist. That always kind of bothered me. I figured camel hair would be kind of itchy, you know, don't you? But then, then I realized this is a camel hair jacket. It's soft. <laughs> so, so maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe it's actually, a, it's actually kind of pleasant for all I know. He wore camel hair with a big belt around his waist, and the reason was because that was what the prophet Elijah, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, wore. Or in other words, he dressed like a prophet. Not just any prophet, but the greatest of prophets calling people to turn their lives around, just as Elijah did. Or the word we use in the church is to repent, to change their lives. He did eat bugs and honey. I thought that was a strange diet. I don't know, maybe it's good for you. I have no idea. And he was doing this new custom. He was baptizing people, baptizing them as a sign of a new life, a changed life. We're going to wash away the old and live for the new. We're going to wash away the darkness and the sin and the brokenness, and we're going to live towards God. He was a messenger to prepare the way for Christ, to make the way straight. John called us to repent, to be baptized for a change, to be called to forgiveness. And repentance is the entrance to faith, which is why it's so important to look at John. He calls us to consider God and be prepared. What would happen if you had Christmas without any preparations? You didn't get any food. You didn't decorate any trees or anything else in the house. You didn't buy any gifts. You did nothing and Christmas Day arrived. It wouldn't feel the same, would it? Because the preparation is a big part of what makes Christmas Christmas. And our preparation is what a big part of what makes our faith work with Jesus. So John shows up, not just in the Gospel of Mark, but in Mark, in Matthew, in Luke, and in John. And do you know why he shows up in all four Gospels? Because John was the most famous, the most well-known, the most respected religious figure of his day. Not Jesus. Compared to John, Jesus was just a minor character along the way. Everybody knew about John. Everybody knew that John was a faithful man of God. And it was a huge happening. Thousands of people were going out to the desert to see John. They were traveling an inconvenient journey out into the middle of nowhere to hear what this man had to say. And he invited them to confess and to see their sin. In another gospel, the gospel of Luke, he he says to the people coming, You bunch of snakes, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do what you're supposed to do. Anybody like their sins being pointed out? No, I don't either. You know, I was with a group of people this week, and and, uh, we were talking about some things, and and, and I thought, these actually were all pastors, and and, and I thought I would say something profound, you know, (laughs) And so I said something about how the experience that day had touched me. And, and one of my colleagues said, yeah, it's all about you, isn't it, Tom? Oh, jeez. Now, I know they were being funny. And I said, well, yeah, it is. But it cut. Do you know what I mean? It cut. Sometimes people don't realize that their comments they make, half-joking can take us right to the heart. Nobody likes to have their sins pointed out. John is pointing out his sins. But we need that to happen. 
Because if we don't know what's wrong with us, we can't fix what's wrong with us. Amen? If you go to the doctor and say, eh, you know, I got some problems, but I'm not going to tell you what they are, you're not going to get very far. In this passage in, in the 11th verse, it actually has the voice coming from heaven. You are my son whom I love and with I am well pleased. And in the verse before, it has the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. So we have with Jesus an image of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? That's kind of an interesting thing that they show up together. The Father is the judge, the creator of all things. He's the one who lays down the laws. He gave the laws on the mountain. He gives the laws to us so we'll know what we're supposed to do. Because without the laws, we can't improve ourselves. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that we need to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. We're supposed to be working on our lives to improve it. We're supposed to be a better person today than we were yesterday and look forward to being a better person tomorrow than we are today, right? Working on our lives. But then the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us. It points out our need for grace. It shows us that we're broken. In John chapter 16, it says about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict our heart. There are times when I pay no attention to what people say about me. We have to, right? If we're going to go through life, sometimes we have to ignore all the comments, all the, all the, the opinions, all the ideas, and, and move in the direction we think we need to go. But there's a time when the criticisms strike, and we know they're real. And they really are about what's wrong with us. And, and, and we feel it. Not because people are trying to hurt us, but because the Holy Spirit is trying to convict us. Just being confident that we're always right and that we never do anything wrong doesn't help us. Sometimes we need to question, we need to even doubt whether or not we're on the right track. That's how we learn. And that's how we grow. It's painful. But it's helpful. Did I make a mistake today? That's why in the, in the course of each worship service, we take a time to actually confess our sins, sins to God. Because confession and repentance are the entranceway to grace. So I'm going to invite you, if you'd like to, today to pray with me now. Dear God in heaven, I have sinned. You know what I've done wrong. And I know a lot of it. What I don't know, please point out to me. And help me to be a better person. Forgive my sins. And move me towards the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you know the words, because you've heard them before, most of you. That, that God has said that if we're faithful and if we confess our sins and repent of our sins, he will forgive us. And so I can say, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Doesn't it feel better? See, because you're all perfect right now. See if you can hold on to that till the end of my sermon. Right? It's a fascinating thing that we go through this. But it's an important thing because when we start to examine our lives and question things, we can find our way towards a healthier faith life. But the difficulty is, is the doubt can also hurt our faith. It can be too much and overwhelming to the point where we start to even question what we know we know. We start to wonder, am I right? Is there really a God? Can I trust that I have faith? Do I believe that I've been forgiven? You have been forgiven. The doubts can cause the greatest people of faith to question. John is in prison, and in Matthew it says to us, 
He heard about the deeds of Jesus and he sent his disciples to him and said, Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? This is the same John who said about Jesus that he's greater than him. He's not even worthy to untie his sandals. He pointed to Jesus and now he questions. Because doubts can get us stuck in repentance. And repentance is good but not by itself. One of the shortest sermons I ever heard, and it was quite effective actually, uh, was delivered in our sanctuary by a a, a local priest by the name of Father Belzer. And he got up and he said, you might have heard the story about the rich man and Lazarus. He said, you know, maybe you're like Lazarus. He said he had sores all over his body, didn't have enough food to eat. He was kind of struggling all the time in a real bad way. Seemed to have no friends except maybe a couple dogs that licked his wounds. Maybe you're like Lazarus. He says, but I suspect a lot of us are more like the rich man. He had a comfortable life. And he was generous. He had invited his friends in for parties and gatherings. And he cared about his family and his brothers. And he was worried about them. And he tried to be be giving to all the people that he knew and cared about. He said, but you should know that Lazarus went to glory while the rich man went to hell. And then he sat down. I've got a big question for you. Who is Jesus? The Son of God! You said that with passion. I like that. What do you think? So why do we need Jesus then? So, because he protects us. So you can stay alive? Yeah, and to protect us. Yeah. What what would we need protecting from? Giant lobsters? Dragons. I just got chills when you said that. I bet you wouldn't be scared of pretty unicorns. Yeah, I I think I would be pretty scared of pretty unicorns. What? It's, it's a thing. It's a thing. So he can protect us from sharks. Ah, I'm scared of sharks. So we need Jesus so he can save us from sharks. Oh, and from sinking in the water. But that's mostly what life jackets guards. You should always wear life jobs jackets. Jobs are. Because sharks are dangerous. Um. So thank goodness for Jesus. If we or pray about him, You're, let's pray. Okay, we should pray that he protects us from all the sharks. And Jesus, we can sharks and eat for our food. Please help you to protect me in case I fall upside down in the canoe. If you're not wearing my life jacket, please bring me up. Amen. 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 So, who is Jesus? He's, he's not just the guy we talk about. He's not just John who convicts us. He's something more than that. John offered religion. Jesus offers grace. The law points to our need for grace. Repentance is good, but grace is better. Who is Jesus? He protects us from sharks and being upside down in a canoe and dragons. Really, dragons are important. You need to find out what a dragon is. But more so, he protects us from getting stuck in repentance. John is the great, this religious figure of his day. He's the Billy Graham of his day, and he points to Jesus. He says that I baptize with water, but the one to come is more important than me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. No one is as great as Jesus. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. The Father gives the law, the Holy Spirit convicts. But Jesus offers grace. So why is it important to look to John? Because John gives us the entrance to our faith. He convicts us of our sin. He tells us of our brokenness and our need. But just empty religion without grace would be harsh and hurtful. And we don't have to live there. We have a Messiah The message of salvation, it says that this is the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Because Jesus is good news. That's what gospel means, good news. And so when John sent his doubts to Jesus, Jesus replied, Nope. 
Matthew 11. There it is. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. With Jesus, we have a world that's turned upside down and our brokenness is made whole and our sin is made good and our lives are transformed. Repentance is good. Grace is better. You see, we, we sometimes get stuck in repentance because if we can push other people down, we don't feel so bad about ourselves. If we can find things wrong with everybody else, we don't feel quite so bad about the brokenness in us. But grace offers us the opportunity to not only make ourselves whole, but bring healing to everyone so that we can all end up in a good place. What would Christmas be like if we had no preparations? It's a good question. But what would it be like if we did all the preparations and had no Christmas? Now that would be the greatest tragedy. What would life be like if we had no Jesus, no grace? So our religion needs to remind us of our need for God. But our faith gives us that God. And when you're looking at, at, at a place where you need to offer criticism and concern and construction and try to fix somebody who's broken, look at yourself. Live inside out. I could turn it inside out, you know, but I'm not going to today. Because the, the idea behind the inside out is that the soft part is turned outside to the people around you. And the difficult, the hard part comes towards us. But this is soft on both sides. <laughs> Maybe that's what we need to be. Maybe we need to find a soft way to help people find out how they need to grow and find out how we need to grow. And certainly we need to offer grace to the world. Because in John 3, 16, and you know this, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But we usually don't read the next verse which says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but what? You see that? God didn't come here to tell us how broken we are. He knows that, and he knows we're good at telling each other how broken we are. What we need is we need someone to tell us how we can be made whole. Amen? My wife and I were watching TV while it was just on. You know, you know how you do that sometimes? You're in a room, and we were visiting, and we are talking, and it was on. And it was on one of these news channels, right? And they just started doing what they do. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked up the remote, and I wanted to say the clicker. That tells me how old I am, right? I picked up the remote, and I shut them off. And it just went peaceful. You know you can turn those guys off. You really do. You can just shut them off. Especially when they, when they go from trying to help you to learn to just being on the attack, the assault, the anger, the nastiness, the meanness. Just turn it off. In fact, if you feel religion is hurtful and mean and biting and cutting, turn it off and turn on Jesus because Jesus is good news. I asked you how you could prepare for Jesus' coming and we came up with fasting and reading the Bible and worshiping and prayer. When I asked the same question to the people who gather with us for worship on Thursday night in Niagara Falls, the first thing they said is, we could help other people. Jeez, didn't think of that one, right? We could be kind. Oh, oh, that's another one, isn't it? We could offer God's love to one another. Don't you think that's the life God would want to come into? It's time for a new beginning. That's what it means to repent. So that we can proclaim good news. Good news. It says in Romans, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve of God's will, his good and pleasing and perfect will, which is to bring love and grace and hope and possibilities. To be a person who's looking for how, how you can be a force for blessing in this world. Not angry messengers, 
but messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the message we bring. How do we do it? Well, there's lots of ways we do it this time of year, isn't it? We put lights on our house to remind people of the light of the world. We give gifts to remind people of the grace that God gives to one another. We sing songs about Jesus. And it helps prepare his way. Last Sunday I was here for the hanging of the green. Some of the rest of you were here. We were doing all kinds of stuff. We were a busy crowd. We were decorating all over the building. We were, uh, had kids making little crafts and things. Santa arrived on a, on a fire engine, you know, and then, then the kids went and saw Santa. We had a big feast and a meal. Some people were cleaning up. We were climbing up on things and hanging things and all sorts of stuff. Some people would have come in and said, what's this got to do with Jesus? Well, around 7 o'clock, it was time for us to come into the sanctuary. We have a little short little service. All we do is sing the first verse of a lot of Christmas songs and read the Christmas story. And as I was walking into the sanctuary with a group of people, I heard a mother say to her child, I don't even know which one it was, she said, hurry up, hurry up, this is the best part. This is the best part. When we go in the sanctuary, and we had over 100 people in here, and we remember why we're here. But I wonder if Santa wasn't there and we didn't have any crafts and if there wasn't any meal and there wasn't any decorating to do and there was nothing to do but just the service, would as many of people have come that night to worship God? Maybe, maybe these little things that we do that we wonder about, the things that, that we somehow feel are, 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 are not having anything to do with God, I've often thought this, are just God's way of getting people who don't worship Jesus to celebrate his birthday. You know, even people who belong to other religions celebrate Christmas. Have you ever thought of that? We've got people going around saying Merry Christmas who don't have anything to do with the Christian religion and God is saying, see, my son's birth will be celebrated. The whole world's going to have a birthday party even if they don't follow God. What's the message? The message the world wants to hear, the message the world needs to hear, is not about John. I'm not going to preach about John for a few months. We're going to preach about Jesus. But John tells us, look at your life, consider it. Where does it need to be fixed so that you can get ready to go on a great journey with God? And what do we say? We say what God has said to us. Do you hear what I hear? Do you see what I see? Do you know what I know? Tell that to the world, and they'll rejoice with you. The way we break the curse is with joy, with the blessings that God has put into our heart to be people of grace that go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need good news today, amen? And God has given us good news, not just for now, but forevermore. So go and be. Go and be citizens. Go and be messengers. Go and be ambassadors for the good news of Jesus Christ. In his peace and joy. Amen.